All right, so today we're finally going to get to the nitty gritty. We're actually gonna get to the calculus. Derivative is our first operation that we were trying to get to. Doing all this limit stuff was all in service of being able to define what the derivative is. So today we finally get to do that, put our limit uh, rules to use. And uh, let's see, the derivative, just in general, Conceptually, we can define it uh, as the derivative, the derivative is the instantaneous, instantaneous rate of change. Instantaneous by instantaneous, if we're not in time, we mean like add a single point at a point. Okay, so the derivative is the instantaneous rate of change. That's one way we can conceptualize what the derivative is. Equivalently, that's saying the slope of a tangent line. So the rate of change of some function, yeah? I've got some function, and I'm saying, how is it changing at that single point? And really what I'm talking about is the slope of that tangent line. So Equivalently, the derivative is the slope of the tangent at that point, okay? So these are conceptual ways to define the derivative, to say what the derivative is. It's instantaneous rate of change of a function. It is the slope of the tangent line, okay? Notation, we have two competing notations actually for the derivative. The calculus was simultaneously invented by Newton and Leibniz. Newton gets the credit because he published first. Actually, Leibniz did it first, but he didn't publish. Anyway, the Newton is kind of shorthand. It's good for inline writing a lot of times. You know, if I have fractions and stuff and I want to put a derivative inside of a fraction, then I don't want fractions inside of fractions generally, so I'll use a Newton notation. The Leibniz notation is actually useful. It, it has meaning, okay? So the Newton, um, if my function is f, f of x, so we're just talking about notation here. f of x is a function. In the Newton speak, the derivative, the slope of the tangent line, would be f prime of x. Okay? That's in the Newton speak. If you see that little prime on there, that's the command to do the operation, find the slope of the tangent line, or take the derivative of that function. Similarly, we, if I wanted to take the derivative of the derivative, that would be prime prime. And then after a while, usually we only go up to the third derivative. We get lazy after that. And we put a little parentheses n x there. It's to denote that um, it's not a power on f. It's an nth derivative, third derivative or fifth derivative or whatever. No, might be. Okay. So this is the Newton speak. Again, this is good for like inline writing stuff. The Leibniz version, it's a little bit flexible, but they look like fractions. So you can either see it as the derivative of f of x with respect to x, like this, where the f is up top, or you could see it as the derivative with respect to x of f of x. Again, this, this ddx, that's a command. It's, the, it's like a, a plus or a minus. It's telling you to do an operation, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Not only in this case does <coughs> these, we'll see later that we can actually manipulate them, but this is telling you what dimension you're looking at and consequently, what variable you're looking at. Say if f was a function of 
many variables, x, y, and z, then taking the derivative with respect to x, that's telling you, okay, I'm looking at the x part of that function. So there's multiple layers of meaning that will become more familiar as we use this notation and go along, especially when we do integration, which is the opposite of the derivative. Okay, uh, if we are doing higher order derivatives in Newton speak, or in Leibniz speak, then we use powers, but we have to be careful, again, not to make, not to make it look like the power is on the function, but rather the power is on the operation, that we're doing that operation multiple times. So it'll look like d squared f of x with respect to x squared like that, or you might see it separated, right? It would just be d squared, dx squared of f. So that'd be your second derivative, the derivative of the derivative of f, and so on, okay. Now, one thing to note about these, I've said it already, it's a command to do an operation. It's a symbol just like plus or minus or multiply or root or anything like that. It's a command to do something. It's not a fraction. These d, uh, very often we, you know, f of x is just y, so you'll see this is dy dx. Very, very often we write it that way too, yeah? Okay, so it looks like a fraction. It's the command to take the derivative with respect to x of this function y. It is not a fraction, but and here's another calculus doublespeak. In absolutely every way, they behave as if they are. We can treat them like they are fractions, as if that dx is down in the denominator and multiply it over to the other side of, of an equation and so forth. Okay, so they, in every way, they behave like fractions, but they aren't. They're command to do an operation. Okay, <coughs> excuse me again. Um, just as a quick ex an example, and we'll see this again, so don't worry about it, but like chain rule, if I have a composite function and I want to take dy dx, say, then I can take dy du times du dx. That is the chain rule. And see, in every way, the du over du, that's looking like it'll simplify to 1, and so I have dy over dx, right? In every way, these things will behave as if they are fractions, but they're not, they're a command. Okay, so that's conceptually what the derivative is, and we've got the notation there. So again, looking back at our preview to calculus, let's see what the problem was, or the problem is, and why we needed all this limit stuff to begin with. So I have some function f. Um, I'm just going to make it like this. Okay. Here's my function f. <laughs> and I want to know the slope of the tangent line at, say, this point right here. So, oops, well, that's sloppy, but okay. So I want to know the slope, the rate of change at that single point, the slope of that tangent line. And let's call this some x, it's some x. So this point here is going to be x, the x value, and then f evaluated at x. Okay, so that defines this point right here. I say, well, I, I really don't know, right, what this derivative is. But I can get the slope of a secant, that is a line that cuts in two spots. I can get that easy. If I pick some other place here, okay. Maybe I have to just, just for the sake of, <coughs> put an axis in there. <coughs> anyway. This distance right here, there's some actual finite distance between these two points, right? Because I'm looking at a secant, the slope of this line that actually cuts it in two spots. 
I say, well, this is going to be just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's an easy slope. That's just use the slope formula. Change in y over change in x and we're done, right? That I can get. So I say, well, this distance here, some finite distance, that's some change in x. Delta x. Yeah? Some change in x. Which will make this point here x plus that change in x, whatever it might be, okay? Which makes this point here, well, its x value is going to be x plus this delta x, this change in x. x plus delta x is its x value. And then to get the y value, I just need to evaluate my function at that x plus delta x. f evaluated x plus delta x. Nice. So to get the slope of that secant line, we know the slope is delta y over delta x. Yeah? Change in y over change in x. So, okay, well, the change in x is x plus delta x minus x. It's just delta x, right? That's, that is the change in x. That's why these symbols have actual meaning, right? Okay, and say, so, well, okay, what's the change in y then? Well, it's f at x plus delta x, this y value. Oops, I didn't close my parentheses. It's this y value minus that. Oh, I also didn't close it. Oh, okay. Minus this y value. So we have f at x plus delta x, that's this y value here on this point, minus f at x, which is the y value on this point, and this is our change in y. Sweet. Okay, this is the slope of the secant line. Now, the problem is, I'm going to hold this fixed right here, and as I let this point get closer and closer, what's going to happen is that secant line, the slope of that secant line, that is to say, is going to get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to the tangent line. However, if I were to try to evaluate at the tangent line, delta x is zero, right? What is the change if my delta x is zero, then zero. So we get an undefined function there, which is why we needed that limit stuff. We're looking at exactly this sort of a situation, right? Where there is some value here, L. I mean, the tangent line has a slope, right? It's some finite value there. But if I try to evaluate it, I get undefined. I get divided by zero every time. So there is some L here, but if I try to evaluate the function, no, the function is not defined there. See, well, if I take the limit, if I get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, yeah, it's going to approach this L value, yeah? So even though I can't find what that L value is by a direct substitution in here because my denominator would be zero, Instead, what I can do is take the limit, let it get closer and closer and closer and closer to that value without actually ever getting there. That's what the limit does. So all I need to do is to take this secant line and take the limit. Now, what am I doing? What's changing in that limit? Well, I'm making this delta x get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. There's less and less change between these two points, okay? So I want to make the limit as delta x goes to zero. So I want to make that change in x get smaller and smaller and smaller of our secant line. f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. That is the limit definition of the derivative. How do we define mathematically what the derivative is? How are we going to go about finding that? We say, okay, I'm going to take the secant line 
and make that change in x go to zero. I know I can't evaluate there, but I can take its limit. Okay, that's it. That is the definition of the derivative. Okay. Now, caveat, warning. In the long run, that is not the method we're going to end up using to take the derivative. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me again. <clears throat> we're going to use the, de the definition of the derivative to figure out what the basic rules are. Like, how do I find the derivative of some polynomial function? If you just hand me a, a cubic or something, can I take its derivative? Well, we're going to need to derive those rules. How do I get at those rules? By definition. Once we've done that, once we've got the rules, that's what we'll use. It's much quicker and simpler. We're not going to do out the whole limit definition every single time, every time we want to try to take a derivative of some function. It's going to take like a 20 line problem, perhaps, that really would only be a one line problem because it's a basic rule. Okay. So that's the idea. This is the limit definition of the derivative. This is why we needed the study of limits because we're going to use those properties that the rules for limits in order to figure out what the slope of the tangent lines are for various functions. Okay. Good. So let me put that up here somewhere so that it's always around. We're going to be fitting to it over and over and over and over again. So we have the limit as delta x goes to zero of f evaluated at x plus delta x minus f at x over delta x. That's the limit definition of the derivative. All right. So let's start with, um, well, let's show that the derivative with respect to x of 2x plus 1 is, well, let's think about it. The function that we're looking at here is 2x plus 1. It's a linear function. Linear functions are defined by the fact that they have a constant rate of change, always, always, always. That rate of change is the slope, right? So I'm asking, what is the rate of change? What is the slope on this line at any point? It should just be the slope of that line. It should just be 2. All right. So let's use the definition to show that that's the case. We'll say I need, well, first of all, let's say f of x is 2x plus 1. That's the function that we're looking at. Okay. Now, f prime at x, or the derivative, the derivative with respect to x of f is, by definition now, the limit as delta x goes to 0. My delta x is downstairs. Now, I need f evaluated at x plus delta x. So this first term is f evaluated at x plus delta x. So I need to take my f and wherever my variable shows up, plug in x plus delta x. So I have 2 x plus delta x plus 1. That's my function evaluated at x plus delta x. Minus, this is my f at x, just the regular function. Just steal it as it is. 2x plus 1. Okay, so there I've set up the derivative of this particular function by the definition of the derivative. Now we're just doing some algebra and seeing what happens. See, 
no, I can't direct sub zero in for delta x because I've got this divide by zero every time. It's a fail. So that's our whole goal the whole time with all the algebra that we're going to do is to try to get a, a factor of delta x out so that we can simplify the divide by zero and actually just direct sub. That's always our goal every time. So let's see if we can actually achieve it on this one. We have the limit as delta x goes to zero. Here, 2x plus 2 delta x plus 1 minus 2x minus 1 all over delta x. Let's see, it looks like some stuff is going away. 2x minus 2x, that's gone. Nice. 1 minus 1, that's gone. Awesome. Now the only thing that's left, everything that's left upstairs, has a delta x in it. Delta x over delta x is just 1. So all I have sitting here is 2. The limit as delta x goes to 0 of 2 is, well, we know we have a rule, right? The limit of a constant, it doesn't matter where it goes to, it's just that constant. It's 2. And we've shown now, by definition, that the derivative of 2x plus 1 is, sure enough, 2. It's the slope. Okay. Now again, there's no way, if you actually asked me to do the derivative of 2x plus 1, that I would do it this way. Clearly, I'd just look at it and go, it's 2. <laughs> right? It's a, it's a line. So its rate of change is just the slope. But just to show you how this procedure plays out and what our goal is, it's always to try to get rid of this divide by zero here so that we can just actually take the limit in a value. Okay. Now, let's start with the simplest derivative rule. The most basic derivative rule we can have. Let's show the derivative with respect to x of a constant is, well, it's asking what is the rate of change of something that's constant? Well, not, right? It doesn't change. That's what it means to be constant. So the derivative of a constant should be zero. Constant never changes. All right, so let's use the definition to show that this is actually the case, that the derivative of a constant is zero. So I have a limit as delta x goes to zero of my function, well, delta x is downstairs, my function evaluated at x plus delta x. Wow, it's always constant, right? It's c. Minus the function evaluated at x, well, it's always c. Okay. This is the limit as delta x goes to 0. 0 divided by delta x. Well, delta x is always finite, remember. We're taking its limit. We're letting it get closer and closer and closer to 0. But it's never actually 0. We're allowed to direct, uh, direct sub in treat it as if it's zero, right? Because it's arbitrarily small. We can make it as small, as sm it's smaller than any given distance, but it's not zero. So zero divided by anything is just zero. And again, the limit of a constant is that constant. There we go. So th there we've proven that the by the definition here, that the derivative of a constant is zero. That's one of our most basic derivative rules. Derivative is constant is zero, right? So forevermore now, now that we've just shown it by, de we've proven it by definition. If you were to ask me, you know, what is the derivative with respect to x of three? 
there's no way I'm going to do this, right? I'm going to go, this is a constant. It doesn't change. Its derivative is zero. The derivative constant is zero. That's one of my basic rules. We're done. So that's just a one line problem. So there's our most basic derivative of a constant is zero. Uh, let's go up a step in complexity. And let's look at the derivative with respect to x of x. Well, that would be dx dx. It's asking, as x changes, what rate does x change? Well, at the exact same rate, right? The ratio would have to be 1. So that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it, well, we have dx over dx. That's just 1, right? The other way to think about it is to say, oh, well, x is a linear function. Linear functions are defined by having a constant rate of change which is its slope, its slope is one, we're done. Okay, this is one of those fantastic coincidences or universal uh, coincidences, I guess, that makes it work out really awesome. That dx dx is actually a one. This is one of the reasons why we can treat them as if they're uh, fractions, even though they're not, because it's behaving just like it is. Okay. So we want to prove that the derivative with respect to x of x is 1. Fair enough. So we're going to go back to our definition. We say, okay, limit as delta x goes to 0. I need, now it's going to be over delta x. It's always the case. I need my function evaluated at delta x, and then just my regular function. Okay. So I need to evaluate the, at just x at x plus delta x. All right, so I've got x plus delta x here. I'm just plugging in that wherever x shows up. It just shows up the ones. And then my function x is just x. This one, you can probably already see it, yeah? Limit as delta x goes to zero. Of x minus x, that's gone. So I have delta x over delta x. But delta x over delta x, that's, these are finite, right? They're just some change in x. So that's just 1. And the limit of a constant is always the constant. Boom. So there we've proven our second derivative rule, or basic derivative rule. The derivative of x is 1. Derivative with respect to x of x. proven it by definition. Nice. Now that's done forevermore. We're not going to do it using the, the limit definition other than to just say practice trying to do this. Okay. Nice. So we've got derivative of a constant is zero. Derivative of x is one. Um, Let's prove that similar to limits, like you can do for limits, is we can pull a constant out, right? So let's prove that. The derivative with respect to x of a constant times some function is the constant times that function, or times the derivative. Constant times the derivative of that function. So we can pull constants out of derivatives. All right, that's the rule that we want to prove. So we'll start with our definition. Limit as delta x goes to zero of, well, we got over delta x every time. Now, I have C, I have this, this function here evaluated at x plus delta x. So I have 
C F at x plus delta x minus I need just the regular C times F at x okay there's our setup by definition now I can pull a common factor of C out so I have C times f at x plus delta x minus f at x over delta x. Limit. Oops. Yeah. Oh. Delta x goes to zero. Okay. So I just pulled that out, common factor out. But now this, we have a product here, and limits are well behaved with regard to products, right? So this is the limit as x goes to zero, or delta x goes to zero, of that constant times the limit as delta x goes to zero of f at x plus delta x minus f at x over delta x. Okay, so we use the, the product rule for limits in order to do that. And now we know that the limit of a constant is just that constant, right? So I have C times this limit right here. But wait a minute. The limit as delta x goes to zero of this difference, f at x plus delta x minus f at x over delta x, that is the derivative of f, right? By definition. So this is the derivative with respect to x. So there we've shown that the derivative of c times f at x is c times the derivative of f. We can pull constants out of derivatives. Derivative of c times some function is c times the derivative of that function. Good. So just to show you how that looks, something like what's the derivative with respect to x of 3x, right? Well, I can pull that outside, the 3, right? This rule tells me pull it outside. So I've got 3 times the derivative with respect to x of x, but that's one of our basic rules. The derivative of x with respect to x is just 1. This is 3 times x, or 3 times 1, excuse me, which is 3. Nice. So that's how it would actually just play out. The rules play out. Now, really, if you just look, if you handed me that, there's no way I'm actually even going to make this a four-line problem. 3x is a linear function. It's got to be the slope. It's got to be 3. But that is how these rules allow us to do that, right? Okay. One more rule, I think, for this video. Let's show that the derivative with respect to x of f of x well, I want to give you the whole rule. I don't want to prove both of them. The one follows from the other. The subtraction one follows from the sum. Uh, just flippy flopping signs around. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to write the full blown rule here. F of X plus or minus G of X. But we'll only prove the plus one. The minus one is just the same argument with flippy floppy signs. We want to show that the derivative is actually well behaved with respect to sums and differences. In other words, the derivative of the sum or difference of two functions is in fact the sum or difference of the derivatives of the two functions. Is equal to the derivative of f plus or minus the derivative of g. Okay. 
In other words, derivatives are well behaved with respect to sums and differences. Okay, so we'll start off. By definition, the limit is delta x goes to zero. Now we've got it over delta x. I need quite a bit of space here. And then over delta x. Now I need to evaluate. We'll, we'll just look at f of x plus g of x for now. So I have f evaluated at x plus delta x plus g evaluated at x plus delta x. This is my function f plus g evaluated at x plus delta x. Minus, now just the straight function, right? f at x plus g at x. All right. There we go. Little bit of algebra here. We have f at x plus delta x minus f at x plus g at x plus delta x minus g at x. Hopefully, you start to see it already. All over delta x, limit as delta x goes to zero. Now I can split those, right? This is a common denominator. So this is f at x plus delta x minus f at x over delta x plus g at x plus delta x minus g at x over delta x. Limit as delta x goes to zero. We have a rule that says limits are well behaved with respect to sums and differences. Okay, so this is going to be an identical argument, like I say, with flippy floppy signs, um, if that's a minus up there, f of x minus g. But we have a rule that says we can split sums and differences of limits. So this is the limit as delta x goes to zero of f at x plus delta x minus f at x over delta x plus the limit as delta x goes to zero of g at x plus delta x minus g at x divided by delta x. But this is the definition, this is the derivative of f, right? So this is the derivative with respect to x. Uh, have I gone off screen? No, good. This is the derivative with respect to x of f. Plus, well here we have the, de by definition again, this is g at x plus delta x minus g at x over delta x. This is the derivative of g. Okay. And there we've at least proven it explicitly for f at x plus g of x. The same argument or similar argument, like I keep saying, holds for the subtraction just signs flip around, right? You have to pull out a common factor of a negative and, and then you're right back in the situation here. Okay, so that is another one that says, uh, another basic rule, and it says that derivatives are actually well behaved with respect to sums and differences. We can split them apart. So let's see the rules that we've got so far. Will allow us to find the derivative of any linear function so far. Any linear function, even though we know that it's just a slope. But we can use the rules that we've got here in order to find the derivative of any linear function. So let, let me show you what I mean why these rules let us do that. So let's take the derivative with respect to x of 5x minus 2, right? So some linear function, I just plugged in value. Well, first of all, we know that 
the, the derivative is well behaved with respect to sums and differences. So this is the derivative with respect to x of 5x minus the derivative with respect to x of 2. Now, usually, if I was actually doing this problem, I wouldn't write this line. I just understand the fact that I can do each of those derivatives separately. Right? So I do this one first, then I do this one second. All right. Here we have a rule that says I can pull that constant outside. This is 5 times the derivative with respect to x of x minus, well, the derivative of a constant is 0. We have that rule. We know this just vanishes. So that's minus zero. Now we have a rule, the derivative of x with respect to x is one. Five times one minus zero, which is five, sure enough. Which is the slope of that line, which makes sense. Okay, so, so far the rules that we've developed, these basic rules will allow us to do any linear function. Now, I don't want to leave this, but I, I don't want to prove it in this lecture video either. We'll prove it in the next one. Um, but I'm going to give you the rule anyway, so that we have the ability to do all polynomial functions. Okay. In order to do that, we need one more rule. We've got the ability to split plus and minuses. We know constants are zero. The derivative of x itself is one. Um, we can pull constants out. The one more rule that we need is how to deal with higher powers on x. So the, up, it's the power rule is what it's called. So the derivative with respect to x of x to the n. What is this? Well, it's simpler than you would think. Okay, The proof is not, but the rule itself, it's not bad. I'm going to take the power and multiply in front. I'm going to bring it down as a coefficient in front. Multiply. n times x to the, all I need to do is subtract 1. Subtract 1. n minus 1. This is the power rule. Okay? So, for example, what's the derivative with respect to x of x cubed? Well, Bring the 3 out front. 3x subtract 1. Square. Done. That's how easy those are. Let's see how it would actually play out. I keep saying that when you bring that power down, multiply. Right? Because we know that we can pull the constant outside and then we're going to have to multiply back in. So why don't I just multiply as I go? Let me show you what I mean. What's the derivative with respect to x of, say, 4x to the fifth? Well, I know that I can pull this 4 outside, 4, and then take the derivative with respect to x of x to the fifth, which is going to be a 5x to the fourth. So I get 4 times 5x subtract 1 to the fourth power, and then I have to multiply that at the end, which is 20x to the fourth. Or I could have just multiplied as I went, right? Just take, I don't need to do all this pulling this stuff outside and then multiplying later. I'm just going to go 5 times 4 is 20x subtract 1. It's a one-line problem. Let me show you another one. What's the derivative with respect to x of 10x to the 6th? Well, 6 times 10, 60x to the 5th subtract 1. And we're done. Now, with the power rule, the ability to split constant and x, then we have the power to do all polynomial functions, to find the derivative of all polynomial functions. Now. Let me show you. Let's say I want the derivative with respect to x of um, 3x to the 5th minus 2x cubed plus x squared minus 5. Okay. Now, 
how would this actually play out? How hard is this problem actually to do? Well, 5 times 3, 15. Subtract 1 from the power, x to the 4. Minus, because I have 3 times negative 2, so minus 6, x subtract 1. Square. 2 times 1, bring my power down, subtract 1, x. Derivative of constant is 0. We're done. That is it. Okay, that's how easy it is now with these rules in the background. Now really, what did we do? We split these each apart, right, on the sums and differences so that we could do each one separately. Then we pulled the constants out front and waited for them later. And then we did our power rule and then we multiplied through. But we didn't need to do all that stuff, right? Those are going on in the background. That's what justifies our ability to do this. But ultimately, that's, that's all it is, okay? So like the derivative with respect to x of um, 3x cubed plus 4x squared minus 2x plus pi. Well, 6x, oops, why did I do that? That's supposed to be cubic. So 9x squared, 3 times 3 and then just subtract 1, plus 2 times 4 is 8, and then subtract 1, and then 1 times negative 2 is just negative 2. Now, that ends up being x to the 0, right, if I subtract 1. So my rule still is logical. It still works, because x to the 0 is just 1. So I get 2 times 1, but I don't even need to worry about that, right? I just take it. I know that the derivative of x is just 1. We just need that. And the derivative of constant is zero, so we're done. That's it. That's how easy it is. All right. I think that's good for our first introduction to the limit definition. We've derived some of the basic rules. Even though we haven't proved the power rule, we have it. And with it, and the others that we have actually proven today, we now have the power to find the derivative, the slope of the tangent line, for any polynomial function, which is pretty Pretty cool. It's a good start. All right.